Welcome. I'm back. I'm for you. Part five of module one. Which is the status of taxation? What do you understand when you talk about the status of taxation? It's the place of authority that has the right to impose and collect taxes. And the basis of determinants of taxation, as we said before, is jurisdiction and the symbiotic relationship. So we already talked about uh, the symbiotic relation, and uh, that will be taken up again in module two, which is criteria in imposing Philippine income tax. Let's look at the most popular area here in taxation for the bar exams, which is double taxation. You notice here that when you talk about double taxation, if it is the one that's prohibited, then of course you won't have empty pockets because you're going to pay the tax only once. However, if this indirect duplicate taxation, the economic burden would fall on you twice and therefore you end up with having empty pockets. So this is a very, very popular area as you shall find out. Uh, it was us uh, again in uh, 76, 78, 2016. But there have been questions within the range of the 2000s where this area was asked, as you should find out later on. So, you have a general meaning of double taxation. When you look at the general meaning of double taxation, you will not know whether this double taxation that is in general sense would in effect invalidate the tax measure or not. Why? It merely says taxing the same subject or object twice, and that's all. Now, but there are two kinds of double taxation. You have direct duplicate taxation, which violates the equal protection clause and uniformity clauses of the Constitution. And therefore, one of those clauses will be invalidated. On the other hand, you have indirect duplicate taxation, which is not repugnant to the Constitution. So, therefore, let's have a look at this. You have two tax laws. If there is direct duplicate taxation, then one of the tax laws will be invalidated, and therefore there could only be one tax collection, and the economic burden falls only once. However, if you have two tax laws, and there is indirect duplicate taxation, then the two tax laws could collect the same taxes and consequently the economic burden would fall twice you have to pay more. So you have again the other names that may be used here. It will be uh, double taxation in strict sense, it's known as direct duplicate taxation, or in its broad sense, indirect duplicate taxation where there is no constitutional violation. So let's look at the bar test here in general. Question. When an item of income is taxed in the Philippines and the same income is taxed in another country, is there a case of double taxation? Notice there. In, it, in this general sense, yes. Why? Because the same subject is taxed twice by, the dif by different taxing authorities. However, this type of double taxation is not prohibited by the Constitution because it's not direct duplicate taxation which is violative of the equal protection in the uniformity clauses. The reason is that the taxes are imposed on the same subject but by different taxing authorities. So let's have a look at another concept, typical bar question number two. Explain the concept of double taxation. So again, Look at the subject weight, is it 5% or less, or is it more than 5%? So 5% or less, truncated answer. If it is more than 5%, then expanded answer. Just have a look at this, review this later on, and understand it, and uh, internalize the reasoning process behind this. Let's have a look at double taxation in its strict sense. When you talk about double taxation in its strict sense, you're talking about direct duplicate taxation. 
Direct duplex taxation was quite popular and I still say this is very dangerous for the bar. So when you look at the pattern, it was asked in 2014, 2016, and 2018. And therefore, I suspect you will have one during the bar examination you're going to take. What is double taxation in the strict sense or direct duplicate taxation? I'll teach you now a method of analyzing a problem, whether it is direct duplicate taxation or indirect duplicate taxation. You must always look at the elements of a concept that you're studying. For example, in instance, you have the element of double taxation, which is sameness. So you have the same subject or object ta is taxed twice, but the same taxing authority for the same taxing purpose and during the same taxing period. But remember, this is only one of the elements of direct duplicate taxation. So even if all the elements of sameness are present, there is still no direct duplicate taxation. Why? Because there is no violation of the Equal Protection Clause and Uniformity Clause of the Constitution. In short, there is no discrimination if all of them are going to be subject to the same same uh, tax, by the same taxing authority, etc. What makes it violative of the Constitution is the second element. And what is the second element? The second element is taxing all for the first time without taxing all for the second time, without for showing any valid reason why for the second time here not all of them are going to be subject to tax. So this is now what makes it violative of the Constitution. So do not forget that two must concord with each other. Absent one of the elements, then there is only indirect duplicate taxation, which does not violate the Equal Protection Clause and therefore could not nullify a tax measure. So, let's have a look at an example here. Now, but remember, in the example uh, which was decided by the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court looked at only the first element, the sameness. The Supreme Court did not discuss anymore the second element. But I suggest, for purposes of the bar, that you must always discuss both of them. The two must be present, the sameness and the second, taxing all for the first time without taxing all for the second time. So let's look at this particular uh, issue here. So, what is an example of direct duplicate taxation? Here the Supreme Court said that the tax was on the same subject matter, which is the privilege of doing business in the city of Manila. For the same purpose, to make persons conducting business within the city of Manila contribute to city revenues, with the same taxing authority, the city of Manila, within the same taxing jurisdiction, within the territorial jurisdiction of the city of Manila, for the same taxing period, and of the same kind or character, a local business tax imposed on gross sales or receipts of the business. And what is that? Uh, but you have no choice. You must write this in your answers. Plus what I taught you, taxing all for the first time without taxing all for the second time. Let's look at our problems here and try to resolve them because as I said, as I, uh, remember my warning, do not go inside the bar examination room without mastering the concepts of double taxation. So, you have this. Is double taxation a valid defense against the legality of a tax measure? So, you have two kinds of answers here. And these two kinds of answers conflict with each other. So you must have come up with the reconciliation if you want to have a perfect answer. So this is a good answer already. But to my mind, this is not the perfect answer. So, so, so. Yes, if the double taxation is direct duplicate taxation, 
then in such a case, it will be a valid defense against a tax measure. Tax measure would be notified for being unconstitutional because it violates the Equal Protection Clause. Then you have the other one, no. First one is yes, this one is no. Reread and read this in order to be able to internalize the issue. If the double taxation is indirect duplicate taxation, it could not be a valid defense against a tax measure. Tax measure will be valid because it does not violate the equal protection clause. So, what then is my suggested answer if 5% or less? Double taxation may or may not be a valid defense against the legality of a tax measure. If the double taxation is direct duplicate taxation, it could be a valid defense because it is violative of the formality of taxation and the equal protection clauses of the Constitution. If the double taxation is indirect duplicate, it could not be a valid measure defense against the tax measure. Tax measure will be valid because it does not violate the uniformity and equal protection clauses of the Constitution. So you notice how you came up with the reconciliation of the two conflicting, conflicting answers. Now question, why do I suggest this instead of having the two separate? Uh, answer yes and answer no. Why do I suggest this? Because if so, you say yes and your examiner believes it's no, then you are dead meat. And by the same token, if you write no but he believes yes, you're also dead meat. That is why you must uh, discuss both of them, but you must reconcile so that the examiner now would know that you know both sides and know how to reason out. More than 5%, notice the expansion here, how it was expanded. Now, let's have a look at another question here. This time, I would like to not take note that this is a fact-centered question. So as usual, what are you going to do? As usual, we're going to look at the question at the bottom of the problem. And the question is, does this amount to double taxation? So you go back and have a look at the factual setting. And while you're doing that, you try to recall what you talk about in so far as double taxation is concerned. So go back. So the issue is double taxation. KM Corporation, doing business in the city of Caloocan, has been a distributor and retailer of clothing and household materials. It has been paying the city of Caloocan local taxes based on sections 15 and 17 of the Revenue Code of Caloocan City, the code. Subsequently, the Sangonian Panlusod enacted an ordinance amending the code by inserting section 21, which imposes a tax on businesses subject to excess tax, excess value as present taxes under the NRC at the rate of 50% of 1% per annum on the gross sales and receipts on persons who sell goods and services in the course of trade and business. Now take note again, as you're running through this, try to recall what we have talked about. And if you do recall right, you would notice that this is the Coca-Cola Coca -Cola case. And the Coca-Cola case was related in the case, uh, again, of Acevedo. So, KM Corporation paid the taxes due under Section 21 under protest, claiming that local government units could not impose a tax on business or the tax under the NRC. And this would amount to double taxation since this business was already taxed under Section 15 and 17 of the code. Does this amount to double taxation? So, again, let's go back 5%, more than 5%. Yes, this amounts to double taxation since because KM Corporation is taxed twice when it should be taxed but once. There's indeed double taxation since KM Corporation is subjected to the taxes under both Sections 15, etc., of the Revenue Code of Caloocan City, expanded, etc.
Now, this again said, this was 2014, we have the earlier case of Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola cited nursery care versus Acevedo. That's why I call this Acevedo, guys. It's easier to remember than saying nursery care corporation. What about double taxation in its broad sense? So we finish already with uh, double taxation in its strict sense. Double taxation in its broad sense is nothing more than indirect duplicate taxation. So notice that this area is more popular. But taken together, you would notice then that if you have mastered this and you took the bar exam in 2019, you've gotten the correct answer already. So 2011, 2013, 15, 17, and 19. Well, technically, almost every year, you have a question asked in the area of double taxation, except that this is double taxation in its broad sense. So, what is double taxation in its broad sense or indirect duplicate taxation? Now, do not forget what I told you. Remember the elements of direct duplicate taxation. If one of them is missing, then it is indirect duplicate taxation. And it's not violative of the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution, and therefore, it should not result to nullification of a tax measure. So, so in general, is taxing the same subject or object twice during the same taxing period. I made mention of the fact a while ago that if one of the elements of direct duplicate taxation is absent, then you have indirect duplicate taxation. It does not violate the equal protection in uniformity clauses of the Constitution. So, let's go back. You have the elements of direct duplicate taxation. You have the element of sameness. You also have the element here of taxing all for the first time with the taxing all for the second time. And uh, consequently, one of these elements is missing, then there is indirect duplicate taxation, which does not violate the Constitution. What's an example here? So, remember, just take note of what is absent. For example, you have this case of a bank. It was said that there is no prohibited double taxation, where a 20% final withholding tax on interest income and the 5% grocery tax are both imposed by banks. Why? The taxes are imposed on two different subject matters. The taxing periods are different. These two taxes are of different kinds of characters. The final withholding tax is an income tax subject to withholding, while the grocery tax is a percentage tax not subject to withholding. So take note of the point of distinction between them, and also remember that this area is very, very dangerous for you. In, short, in fact, the whole area of double taxation is very, very dangerous. So let's look at how bar problems pass. Again, here you have uh, one that is a fact-based problem, but very short. That's why you don't look at any more at the bottom. You go direct and look at it from the beginning. X a lesser of the property pays real estate tax on the premises, a real estate dealer's tax based on rental receipts, and income tax on the rentals. X claims that this is double taxation. Decide. Oh. Again, similarly, 5% or less, very short answer. More than 5% expanded answer. Let's look at another problem here. It seems to be different, but the concept is still the same. So let's go to the bottom because it's longer. Is the refusal of the mayor justified? They should briefly. So what is the refusal of the mayor? You don't understand why he refuses to sign. So you go back one sentence. 
the municipal mayor of CC refused to sign the ordinance on the ground that it would constitute double taxation. So you remember outright that the mayor was thinking that this is in fact direct duplicate taxation. So you try to reflect then the elements of direct duplicate and if all are present, then the mayor is correct. But if one of the elements is absent, then the mayor just uh, refusal is not justified. So we start from the beginning now. Again. A municipality BP as an ordinance which requires that all stores, restaurants, and other establishments selling liquor should pay a fixed annual fee of 20000 Subsequently, the municipal board proposed an ordinance imposing a sales tax equivalent to 5% of the amount paid for the purchase or consumption of liquor in stores, restaurants, and other establishments. The municipal mayor of CCA refused to sign the ordinance on the ground that it would constitute double succession. Is the refusal of the mayor justified reason before? As usual, you have the five and the more than five rule. No, there is no double taxation because there are two different subjects and objects of taxation. In fact, you're telling the examiner that one of the elements is lacking and the second is sameness insofar as subjects and objects is concerned. But you must explain. The first, the fixed annual fee is a tax for the privilege of engaging in business well, the second is a tax on the purchase or consumption. Then you have the expanded answer here. So uh, go back and have a look at the expanded answer, at least sure, and then try to internalize the reasoning processes involved. Let's just have a look at the 2019 bar exams. You notice it is a fact central problem. And since it is one, you'll have to go to the bottom and look at what the examiner wants. So the bottom says, rule on each of ABC corporations contentions. But then you don't know the contentions. You still have to go back one or two sentences backwards. So let's go back and have a look at the problem then. So, based in the following contentions. Number one, the provision, new provision is a form prohibited double taxation because it essentially amounts to CTX imposing VAT, which is already being divided by the national government. And number two, since the VAT being imposed is second to VAT, it is beyond the power of the city to leave the same rule on each of ABC's corporation's contentions. So go back and have a look at the problem and look at the problem closely. In 2018, CTX amended its revenue code to include a new provision imposing a tax on every sale of merchandise by wholesaler based on the total selling price of the goods, inclusive of VAT. APC Corporation, a wholesaler operating within the city, challenged the new law, new provision based in the following contentions. The new provision is a form prohibited double taxation because it essentially amounts to CTX imposing VAT is already being levied by the national government. And two, since the tax being imposed is akin to VAT, it is beyond the power of the city to levy the same rule on each of ABC's corporation's contentions. Again, similarly to uh, what we've been discussing in the past, you must look at this abrupt weight. Is it 5 or more than 5%? So, 5% or less, shorter answer. More than 5% expanded answer. So this is the expanded answer. So again, as I said, when you have time, go back and have a look at this carefully. So we know how to expand the answer. Now, Another area I would like to have a look at is the constitutionality of double taxation. Now, remember again the concepts that we were talking about, the two kinds of double taxation, direct and indirect. So this was the subject of our problems in the past, in the 70s, very popular in the 70s, but lately no question of us in this area. But I lump it together with the general concept of double taxation which is a dangerous area for the bar. So, 
The Philippine Constitution has no specific provision which prohibits double taxation, unlike the U.S. Constitution, which has a specific provision. But direct duplicate taxation may violate the equal protection and the clauses of taxation, as we have explained uh, before. So the whole explanation here. So go back and have a look at this. And what is it you must look at? The elements of direct duplicate taxation, specifically the second element, because the second element is the one that causes the discrimination. All are treated in the same manner during the first instance. But during the second instance, without showing any valid reason for it, some are treated differently. Some are not anymore subject to a tax. So remember this and internalize. So to repeat, direct duplicate taxation nullifies tax measures why? Because of violation of the Equal Protection Clause. Indirect duplicate does not invi invalidate tax measures because there is no violation of the Equal Protection Clause. Let's look at uh, the bar type uh, here to determine what we're going to do. So, is double taxation prohibited by the Constitution? Remember again, the 5 and 10 percent rule. So, 5 More than five What are the modes of eliminating double taxation? Take note that the double taxation referred to here is indirect duplicate taxation. Why? Because in indirect duplicate taxation the economic burden would fall twice. Why so? Because the two laws collecting taxes could stand together and there would be double collection. Upon the other hand, if it's direct duplicate, one of the laws would be nullified and consequently only one of the laws could be the source of collection. So there is no need to ease the burden of double taxation because technically there's no economic burden. Uh, technically there are uh, Two ways, two principal ways of eliminating the rigors or easing the rigors of double taxation, which is indirect duplicate. One is by statute, the other is by treaty. But we'll talk about that in detail in a little while. This area again is a dangerous area, coupled with the other areas of double taxation, as in the world in 2010 and 2015. So it's difficult to forecast. What area is going to be asked in the bar related to double taxation? But what we could forecast is that surely there's going to be a question asked on the area of double taxation. But which area is difficult to forecast? So, let's have a look at the modes here. We said there are two modes. The statute method, again, which is present in our code right now because we allow for tax credit of foreign taxes paid. In short, the foreign taxes paid are allowed to be deductible from the income that is due to the Philippine government. That is if, if the taxpayer now signifies in his return that he wants to avail of the tax credit method. Upon the other hand, there's another method provided under the tax code that is known as the tax deduction method. So under the tax deduction method, the taxpayer does not state in his return that he wants to use the tax credit method, and therefore in that case, he could use the foreign taxes paid as a deduction from his gross income in order to arrive at income subject to tax. This third method, which is the rate reduction method, but a tax code does not provide for rate reduction method. So therefore, the foreign taxes are paid in accordance with tax deduction method. If there's a law that provides for it, then the amount, the percentage of tax, the rate of tax then could be reduced, depending of course upon the nature and character of the foreign tax that has been paid. And the second method is the tax treaty method. So remember the two principal methods and the sub-methods insofar as the statute method is concerned. So let's 
discuss this in detail again for you to be able to internalize very well because sometimes uh, when I talk, it's difficult for you to remember. Uh, two senses must be used in the study of dual. Here, the auditory sense, the lectures, and then the visual sense, which is in fact here what you see. So these are the methods of easing the burden of indirect duplicate taxation. Tax credits where foreign taxes are allowed as deductions from local taxes that are due to be paid. Allowing foreign taxes as a deduction from gross income. So these two are provided for insofar as uh, our tax code is concerned. And then you have the reduction of the income tax rate. We don't have that. Tax treaties which exempt foreign nationals from local taxation and local nationals of foreign taxation under the principle of reciprocity. So what questions have been asked in the bar related to this? So you notice this is uh, now a fact-based problem, but it is short. So we don't anymore uh, go to the extent of going to the bottom to find out. What we're going to do is go direct to the question and read the question. So what is the factual setting of the question? A Filipino citizen receives dividend income from the United States on his capital investments, investments in that foreign country. The dividend being remitted to him is taxed in the United States and at the same time is also being taxed in the Philippines. Has the tax code provided any remedy for such taxpayer? Again, as usual, do we have a 5% or less or more than 5%? Yes, because he could use the foreign income taxes as tax credit or as a deduction from the Philippine income taxes that may do from one sentence answer is already perfect. For 5% or less. But if more than 5%, then you must expand. You must expand, and this is how we are going to expand. So as always, my comment is that go back to it and internalize the expansion. It's nothing more than an enumeration. What are the usual methods of avoiding the occurrence of double taxation? And as usual, 5% or less and more than 5%. And then you have question number three. So, fact base. You don't have to go to the bottom, go direct to the question, because the problem is short. In 2018, Caruso, a resident Filipino citizen, received dividend income from a U.S.-based corporation, which owns a chain of Filipino restaurants in the West Coast, USA. The dividend remitted to Caruso is subject to U.S. withholding tax, with respect of a non-resident alien like Caruso. What will be your advice to Caruso in order to lessen the impact of possible double taxation on the same income? Again, 5% and 10%. I would advise Caruso that he could choose whether to avail of a tax credit deducting the withheld amount from his tax due in the Philippines or deducting the withheld amount from his gross income in the Philippines. So take note of that. Huh? One sentence perfect answer. More than five, expand. Notice the similarity of this with the other problem you've seen previously. Now, what about uh, tax treaties as a relief from double taxation? No questions were sourced from this area from 1964 to 2019. But then I said, let's have a look at this. This is part and parcel of the concept of double taxation, which is dangerous for the bar. So what is the purpose of tax treaties? The purpose of tax treaties is to reconcile the national fiscal legislation of the contracting parties in order to help the taxpayer avoid simultaneous taxation in two different jurisdictions. More precisely, 
the tax conventions are drafted with a view towards the elimination of international juridical double taxation. This is the case of S.C. E. Johnson and Son, decided a long time ago, way back in 19. The 1999 case of S.C. E. Johnson has provided for us the two methods resorted to by tax treaty to eliminate double taxation. So there are two methods. Let's look at the first method here. Under the first method, the tax treaty sets out the respective price of tax by the state of source or situs and by the state of residence with regard to certain classes of income or capital. In some cases, an exclusive right of tax is compared on one of the contracting states. However, for other items of income or capital, both states are given the right of tax, although the amount of tax that may be imposed by the state of source is limited. So take note of that. Huh? So there is a delineation on who could impose the tax. Under the second method, the state of source of the income is given a full or limited right of tax together with state of residence. In this case, the DT makes it incumbent upon the state of residence to allow relief in order to avoid double taxation. Two methods of relief are used under the second method, the exemption method and the tax related method. So, what is meant by international juridical double taxation? It is the imposition of comparable taxes in two or more states on the same taxpayer in respect of the same subject matter and for identical grounds. Double taxation usually takes place when a person is a resident of a contracting state and derives income or owns capital in the other contracting state and both states impose tax on the tax on that income or capital. What is the rationale for avoiding international double taxation? But notice, international double taxation is indirect duplicate taxation, not direct duplicate. Why? Because there are two taxing authorities. The rationale for avoiding international double taxation is to encourage the people of goods and services, as well as the movement of capital, technology, and persons between countries. These are the conditions deemed vital in creating robust and dynamic economies. Foreign investments will thrive only in a fairly predictable and reasonable international investment climate, and the protection against double taxation is crucial in creating such a climate. So another uh, part of the coverage uh, of the bar is escape from taxation. So what are the ways of escaping taxation? Again, uh, this is a bit popular, so we'll have to discuss this in detail and pay particular attention to this because this is part of my focus for the coming bar. You have shifting of the tax burden and then you have tax avoidance and tax evasion. So, shifting of tax burden, as you would notice, is a three star. This is very popular. You learned a while ago of the different kinds of taxes according to tax burden or incidence. You have direct tax and you have indirect tax. Direct tax could not be the subject of shifting, but it is indirect tax that could be the subject of shifting. What did we mark this as a three star? We mark this as a three star because of the frequency in which this exam was given. So if you were uh, if you were reviewing for the 2019 bar, you have seen this uh, incidents, antecedents. Then you would have to take note that the last time was 2017, and therefore it was dangerous for the 2019 bar. That is why for any bar you're going to take uh, next year or the year after next, this is a dangerous area that you must master very well. So let's have a look at the uh, concepts involving shifting of the tax burden. So there are different ways of shifting the tax burden. It's either that the taxes are directly stated on the invoice as part of the selling price or shown separately, we discussed that. And we already talked about indirect taxes. These are the only taxes that can be shifted. Then we'll have a look at the meaning of impact and incidence of taxation. 
So let's go back again and have a look at the ways of shifting, shifting the tax burden. As I said a while ago, the first method is including the indirect tax in the selling price. The second method is bidding or listing the indirect tax separately. So in whatever manner that's uh, being uh, said here, it is always the ultimate consumer that pays the that pays the tax because the tax is shifted being made part of the selling price or built separately. But remember, remember, uh, in the case of uh, Piribin Acetylene, the Supreme Court is speaking to the late uh, former Chief Justice Castro held that the moment the tax is shifted, it ceases to be a tax, it merely becomes a part of the selling price. And consequently, if the party to whom the tax is shifted is a tax exempt entity, it could not claim that it is uh, tax exempt because the tax that was shifted to it ceases to be a tax, it merely becomes part of the selling price. So let's look at the details here. The indirect tax is included in the selling price, and consequently, let's just look at um, one method of uh, shifting tax burden, and that is bidding or listing separately the indirect tax. So let's have a look at this uh, one by one. The method of listing the price separately and defining taxable, taxable gross receipts as the amount received, less the amount of the tax added, merely avoids payment by the seller of a tax on the amount of the tax. It is still the seller who is subject to the tax and not the buyer. So in the case of Philippine Acetylene, the Supreme Court held that the original amount paid by the buyer, Nea, is not payment for the tax, but payment for the purchase of the electric cables. So what are the taxes that can be shifted? So generally, practically all business taxes could be shifted, such as contractor tax, value added tax, excess tax, etc. So I said practically all business taxes are indirect taxes whose burden may be shifted. What is the meaning of impact and incidence of taxation in relation again to shifting the burden of taxation? In indirect taxation, there is a need to distinguish between the liability for the tax and the burden incidence of the tax. The amount of tax paid may be shifted or passed on by the seller to the buyer, but is transferred in such instances is not the liability impact of the tax, but the tax burden incidence. In adding or including the but due to the selling price, the seller remains the person primarily and legally liable for the payment of the tax. But it's shifted only to the intermediate buyer and ultimately to the final purchaser is the burden of the tax. Stated differently, a seller who is directly and legally liable for the payment of an indirect tax, such as the VAT on goods or services, is not necessarily the person who ultimately bears the burden of the same tax. It is the final purchaser or consumer of such goods or services who, although not directly and legally liable for the payment thereof, ultimately bears the burden of the tax. So, what is the rule on exemptions from indirect taxes? So the issue we can talk about here is the instance where there is a, a party who is exempt from the payment of taxes. He bought goods from another party. This other party is not subject to exemption. But this other party paid taxes as a result of the sale. However, in this particular regard, as we said a while ago in the case of Philippine Citizen, the tax merely becomes a part of the selling price. It ceases to be taxed, and therefore any exceptions on indirect taxes is deep not negatory. It is as if there's no exemption, because the burden falls directly on the person. That's why you must make a distinction between the impact of taxation and also the burden of taxation. So let's now have a look at the concepts here.
Let us look at the rule on indirect taxes. Uh, this is now a more detailed explanation compared with what I said a while ago. So this, remember, this is a three-star area which must be mastered by all who intend to take the bar. The liability for the payment of indirect taxes lies with the seller and not with the buyer. And therefore, the buyer cannot invoke his tax exemption privilege to uh, avoid the shifting of an indirect tax, such as VAT, by the manufacturer, suppliers, and the goods he purchased. There is no violation of tax exempt privilege, even if the indirect tax, for example, sales tax, is billed separately in the sales invoice, chargeable to the buyer, because this merely avoids the payment of the tax by the seller who is liable for the tax. The additional amount paid by the buyer, who is tax exempt, is not payment for the tax, but payment for the purchase price. And consequently here, in the case of uh, silk air, the excise tax on aviation fuel is considered an indirect tax. And the proper party to question of silk air refund of an indirect tax is, is the statutory taxpayer, the person whom the tax is imposed by law and of the same even if he shifts the burden to another. This was the holding in the case of silk air. The NIRC provides that the excess tax should be paid by the manufacturer or producer before removal of domestic products from place of production. Thus, Petron Corporation, not Silk Air, is the statutory taxpayer which is entitled to claim a refund based on Section 135 of the Transport Agreement between RP and Singapore. But Petron could not do so because it is not exempt. So let's look at the factual and details here insofar as the case of uh, Silk Air is concerned in relation later on to the case of Chevron and Shell. Why? Because you have to reconcile these three cases altogether, otherwise your answer might be erroneous. So why might be erroneous? Because the doctrine in Silk Air, to my mind, is not applicable anymore. And we'll find out why in a little while. Now, what was the story in the case of Silk Air? The Republic of the Philippines and the Republic of Singapore entered into an agreement whereby their, their uh, country carriers, the national flag carriers, are exempt from the payment of any kind of taxes whenever they buy or purchase items in the other country. So, for example, if part of which is dance carrier of the Philippines goes to Singapore, loads gasoline in Singapore, or buys uh, goods uh, for its uh, duty-free shop, then again exempted from the payment of any tax imposed by Singapore. By the same token, under the same agreement, if a flag carrier of Singapore, such as for example Silk Air, buys gasoline, aviation gas in the Philippines, or other items, it should not also be subject to the payment of taxes. That's the issue there. Now, so a Singapore airline, a Silk Air, uh, a Silk Airlines uh, plane landed in the Philippines and loaded aviation gas from Petron. But before Petron could uh, remove the gas from its storage tanks, it has to pay the taxes because the taxes are due upon withdrawal. So it paid the corresponding taxes, and then it built Silk Air to include the corresponding taxes that were due on the article on the aviation gas. Subsequently, Silk Air, invoking its privilege under the treaty, asked for a refund of the tax due. Supreme Court said no, because you did not pay a tax. Why is it that Silk Air did not pay a tax? Because we said this is an indirect tax, and when the indirect tax is passed, on it ceases to be a tax, it will become part of the selling price. But the issue is, could Petron ask for an exemption? Uh, could ask for a refund? No. Why? Because Petron is not tax exempt. But why do I have this question mark here? I have this question mark because of two cases, the case of Shell and the case of Chevron, where both uh, Shell and Chevron were able to obtain refunds of the taxes they paid. So, uh, 
let's have a look at these two cases now. But before we look at the two cases, let's look at the fractionization by the Supreme Court. Why Petron and why Silk Gale could not obtain again a refund? The exception granted under Section 125B of the NRC and Article 42 of the Air Transport Agreement between ARP and Singapore, without a clear showing of legislative intent, cannot be considered as including indirect taxes. The court went further to say that the statutes granting tax exemptions must be construed in its juries against the taxpayer and liberally in favor of the taxing authority. And if an exemption is found to exist, it must, be, it must not be enlarged by construction. So that is the story insofar as silk air and petron is concerned. However, we have the cases of Shell and Chevron. The case of Shell and Chevron effectively has reversed the doctrine in the case of silk air and, uh, and uh, petron. But why effectively? Because the rule on indirect taxes still stands. In short, what is meant by that is that if the indirect tax is passed on to a tax exempt entity, the tax exempt entity could not claim its exemption because when the tax is passed on, it ceases to be a tax, it merely becomes part of the selling price. So let's now have a look at the cases of Shell and Chevron. The holding in the cases of uh, Shell and Chevron is that the statutory taxpayer of the tax on aviation gas is entitled to refund. And who is the statutory taxpayer here? Shell and Chevron were similarly situated as Petron. So, the statutory taxpayer such as Shell Filipinas, who is directly liable for the excise tax on its petroleum products, is entitled to refund or credit of the excise tax. It paid for petroleum products sold to international carriers the latter have been granted exemption from the payment of the excise tax under Section 135 of the NRC. So take note of uh, the case citation here. What is the rationale for the grant of the refund? Now remember, huh? remember. In the Petron case, uh, Silk and Petron case, the statutory taxpayer couldn't ask for a refund because it does not enjoy a tax exemption privilege. And therefore, the Supreme Court said that if there's any exemption granted to the air that could not be expanded to include again the exemption to Petron. So, what about this case that, that we're talking about? The rationale for the grant of the allowing the grant of a refund to uh, Shell and subsequently Chevron is that. Excess tax on aviation fuel used for the international flights is practically nil. As most countries are signatories to the 1944 Chicago Convention on International Aviation, the exemption from excess tax of aviation fuel purchased by the carriers for consumption outside the Philippines fulfills a treaty obligation pursuant to which our government supports the promotion and expansion of international travel through avoidance of multiple taxation and ensuring the viability and safety of international air travel. Now, why safety of international tra air travel? The court observed that if you don't allow for the exemption, then there's going to be, there's going to be tankering. What is meant by tankering? Tankering means that uh, before the airplane leaves for the Philippines, it now loads a lot of fuel because it's going to be taxed on the fuel in the Philippines. That is tankering. And since the airplane, again, would be fully loaded with gas, it's going to be dangerous for air travel. That's why I say it promotes safety international travel. Now, let's continue. The states have long accepted the need for international cooperation in maintaining a capital incentive, intensive, labor intensive, and fuel intensive airline industry and recognize the major role of international air transport in the development of international trade and travel. 
under the basic international law principle of Pacta San Servanta, we have the duty to fulfill our treaty obligations in good faith. This entails harmonization of national legislation with treaty provisions. In this case, Section 25A of the NRC embodies our compliance with our undertakings under the Chicago Convention and various bilateral air service agreements not to impose excise tax on aviation fuel purchased by the national carriers from domestic carriers. Section 25A prohibits a domestic manufacturer to pass on to international carriers the excise tax paid on petroleum products upon their removal from the place of production pursuant to Article 148 of the Tax Code and pertinent BIR regulations. So you notice again the point of distinction between the two and watch out carefully. Supposing the question is asked, could Petron obtain a refund based on the shell doctrine on taxes paid on aviation gas which was denied under the shell air doctrine? No. If the doctrine of operative facts kicking in, and furthermore, the right to claim would have been preserved already by the time that you have the shell doctrine in effect. So let's have a look at the bar, uh, certain bar types here, and uh, let's see how uh, these questions are formulated. Let's have a look at uh, typical bar question number one. You notice the problem is short, even if it is a fact centered problem. That's why you start from the very beginning. So A sold electric cables to Denea, a government corporation granted an exemption from all taxes under its charter. Is the sale taxable? Suppose the sales tax is shown in the invoices as billed or chargeable to the said buyer. Will the conclusion be the same? Explain. So as usual, we have the five and more than 5% rule. So five or less, short answer, more than five, expanded answer. So this is again my suggested answer for questions that were the weight of 5% or less. Short answer. More than five, then you're going to have an expanded answer. Expanded answer. Now, we have another problem here that was given in 2017. Since it is long, we start at the bottom. If you were the Commissioner of Internal Revenue, will you grant REC Corporation's admissive claim for refund or issuance of tax credit certificate? Explain your answer. So let's go back and have a look at the factual setting because we now know what the examiner wants. REC Corporation is a domestic corporation engaged in the business of importing, refining, and selling petroleum products. During the period from September 1, 2014 to December 31, 2015, 14, REC imported 225 million liters of jet A1 aviation fuel and paid the excess taxes thereon. 75% of the total volume of aviation fuel imported were actually sold to international carriers and foreign carriers for the use or consumption outside of the Philippines in the period from November 1, 2014 to December 31, 2014. REC did not pass on to the trans carriers the excise taxes paid on the importation of petroleum products. So when you look at this, you would notice that this, in effect, are similar to the factual setting in the case of Shell and the case of Chevron. Unlike in the case of Shell Air and Petron, where Petron passed on the tax to the foreign carrier. Now, let's continue. On June 25, 2015, REC Corporation filed an initiative claim for refund or issuance of tax credit certificate amounting to the excise taxes it had paid on the importation of 225 million liters of jet A1 aviation fuel. If you were the Commission of Internal Revenue with the grant REC Corporation's initiative claim for refund or issuance of tax credit certificate, explain your answer. So remember, this was based on the case of Shell and Sabron. Therefore, the answer should be in accordance with the holding in that particular case. You ignore the holding in the case of uh, Silk and Petron because the factual antecedents are different. Why are they different? 
Petron paid the tax and passed it on to Silicair. Upon the other hand, in the case of Chevron and Shell, they did not pass on the tax to the international carriers. So as usual, we have the five and the more than five rule. And let's look at our answer here. Again, as usual, remember my advice, go back and have a look at all these problems, look at the answers and analyze them at leisure. So 5% or less. Short answer. More than 5% expanded answer. And that's the end of part five of module one. Let's have a break. After the break, we shall take up part six, distinguish tax avoidance and tax evasion. So enjoy your uh, break. Let's uh, go back and meet each other later on.